this morning and look at lessons from Gideon. So we're going to look at the story of Gideon and hopefully be encouraged by what we see in there, especially in the times we live in today. All right, so let's just go through the story first. I know it may be a familiar story to some of you, but um, sometimes with familiar Bible stories, you don't know all the details that are in it. And it's always interesting to look at some of the detail that's in it and get some lessons from it. So let's start from Judges 6, uh, verse 1. Judges 6, verse 1. Now, these first couple of chapters, really what is happening here, it's just setting the scene to Gideon's story. So you can see the situation that Israel is in at this time. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So you can see that right now they're living under oppression, under another nation, but in their own land, right? And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strong so you can see, why are they in oppression in those days? Well, this is the way God dealt with Israel in the Old Testament, is if they were not a godly nation, then sometimes he would bring them into oppression. But uh, you can also see his grace as well, as you know, even though they were such a sinful nation, when they cried out to him for mercy, he, he uh, gave them a savior. So you can see the picture there of salvation, that even though we are enemies of God and we are you know, oppressed in the sense that we are sinners condemned to hell, when we cry out to the Lord, we call upon the name of the Lord, we can still find grace. In God's eyes. So there's a few pictures going on here. So verse 2 is saying, well, because they're oppressed, you can see that's why they're building, building themselves dwellings in like hiding places, the dens, the mountains, the caves, and the strongholds. So obviously, in Judges, it's giving a bit of history to the reader to say, well, these are why these dens and caves and strongholds existed sometimes because of the oppression that was happening from another nation. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. So you can see oppressive governments tend to be a strain on the country's economy, right? These people are trying to just grow crop and whatnot and then these you know, oppressors are just coming and destroying their fields and everything like that. Hey, stop, stop playing with that. Here. So this is why you understand, this is why Gideon was hiding threshing the wheat because every time they, they, they get this wheat stolen from them, all the crops. For they came up with their cattle in their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude for both they and their camels were without number and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And that's, that's, why I, that's why I wanted to preach on this this morning. We think about oppressive governments, it's like a strain on the economy. And now you see that all these lockdowns put in place and it's like putting people out of business. And I saw you like, you, you saw in Victoria, there was a, a protest that went on of small business owners and they weren't getting support from the government. And they're like, what do we do? Like, you're not allowing us to work. And it just reminds me here of what the Midianites here are, are impoverishing them uh, with their oppressive ways. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them. So this prophet comes to Israel to explain to them why they are living in oppression, right? Sort of what we read in the first verse. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. So he's reminding them what he did for them. And it's very interesting that usually when God comes to them and talks and describes himself to the nation of Israel, he always reminds them what he did for them. You know, so to, to that they get the right perspective of who this God is. Because oftentimes we complain and we don't think about our current situation. And we need to be reminded what God did for us to, to, to know that, you know, who God is. And uh, to us, it would not be, you know, the God that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. To us, it would be the God that died for us on the cross and gave us salvation. And, and we should always be reminded that that's who our God is. Verse 10, And I said unto you, I am the Lord, your God, Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Orpha, that pertained unto Joash the uh, Abiezrite, 
and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So now you understand why is he hiding from the Midianites? Because they're living in oppression and you know, they're stealing all their crops and whatnot. And this is why he has to thresh wheat you know, and hide it from them uh, so that they have something to eat. And I'm sure out of fear as well. And we'll see that as we read through the chapter. So that's setting the scene. All right, now we go into verse 12 onwards. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And sometimes you wonder, like, you know, does God have a sense of humor? But at the same time, I think God sees things in us that we don't always see in ourselves. You know, I mean, here you have Gideon hiding, complaining about what's going on, and yet God comes to him and says, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. I'm sure Gideon is thinking, what is brave about this? You know, I'm hiding, uh, I'm hiding and making, you know, doing things in secret. Uh, There's nothing brave about it. But uh, I think it's great that God, you know, sometimes sees qualities in you that you may not even see in yourself, right? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? So Gideon is a bit perplexed to say, okay, well, you're telling me God is with us. Why are we living in oppression? Why is the world the way it is? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Right? And the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? So you see how he's asking God, what are you going to do about this situation? And God says to him, this is why you are being sent to do this. And he said unto him, oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? This is where you start to see, uh, you know, uh, Gideon's fears, right? Because sometimes when we make excuses, sometimes we're just fearful. Right? We make excuses because we're worried, we're fearful about doing what's right. And here he starts to give excuses. Well, oh, my family is poor. And he's like, who? he's like saying, who am I? You know, I'm nobody rich. I'm nobody of any stature in, in, in Manasseh. You know, we're a poor family. And I am the least in my father's house. And not only are we a poor family, but I'm not even somebody of stature within my own household, right? Amongst my family. And the Lord said unto him, surely I will be with thee and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Right? So we talk about you know, having confidence. You know, having confidence is not like a, a, a humanistic type of confidence where it's like believe in yourself, believe in your abilities. The way Christians should think about confidence is we have confidence because we know the Lord is with us. If we are doing the will of God and we're doing what's right by God, we have confidence knowing that the Lord is with us. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. So Gideon asks God for this first sign. And you'll see, like, he asks for signs all throughout his story. And we'll look at them as we go through them. He says, Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. So he's like, I want a sign, but don't leave. I'm going to go, he's going to go prepare something. And he's going to come back. And, he, and then God says to him, well, okay, I'll wait until you come back again. <laughs> Gideon went in and made ready a kid, right? So what's a kid? It's not a child, it's not a child sacrifice. So a kid is a goat, a baby goat. And uh, unleavened cakes of ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. So he goes and makes some food for uh, this angel of the Lord and for God. You know? And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock. So he puts them on this rock. Pour out the broth. So pour out. Um, sometimes they do that with the wine as well. They do with a lot of the drinks in the Old Testament. They pour it out as giving it to God. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. So you see what happens? He he says, wait, I'm going to prepare something for you. He goes and prepares some meat and some broth and everything. The angel says, so I'll put it on this rock. 
And then with his staff, he touches it and then God consumes it. A flame comes out of the rock and consumes this offering. And when, and Gideon, and when verse 22, and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Right? So that's the first sign that Gideon asked for. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day. It is yet in Orpha of the Abiezrites. So you see, God promises him, don't worry, you, are, you will not be killed. And even though God tells him, hey, I'm going to deliver Israel by you, I'm going to be with you, you're not going to die. We often think of you know, Gideon as a great man of faith and what he accomplished, but you can actually see in the story he was actually a very fearful man and one of little faith, right? He did not believe what God was telling him, and yet God still used him. You know, and it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old. Right? So if you don't understand what that's saying, because I had to read over it a couple of times too, he's actually getting two bullocks here. So he's taking one bullock, young bullock, take thy father's, and even the second bullock. So that's saying, that's another, the way the King James Bible would say, and also right, a second bullock of seven years old. And throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is, that is by it. Right? So as we know, it's, it's overtaken by the Midianites. There's a lot of idolatry going on here and they're worshipping Baal. So God actually tells him, go take two, you know, oxen, right? Or these two bullocks, right? Use one of them to throw down the altar of Baal and then the other you're going to offer as a burnt offering. And where you're going to get the wood from, you're going to cut down the grove, the trees where they worship amongst, right? And use that as the firewood. Verse 26, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. Okay, so now you see, that's why there's the two. Oh, you need to stop kicking the box. Okay, thank you. And offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. So he, you see that picture now? It's got the two bullocks. One, I'm assuming when you throw down an altar of Baal, it's like these, you know, BLM protesters like pulling down all the statues and everything like that of, of historical figures. You know, they, they get the rope around it and they pull it down. You can imagine that's what's happening. You know, these, the altar of Baal is putting a rope and then this, you know, instead of using a tractor like we might today, you know, they're using a, a, a bullock to pull down this statue and pull, pull down this altar. Verse 27, Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. So I'm sure if he was a great man of faith, he would have just done it in front of everyone, right? And just done it boldly in the daytime. But you can see that he has fears just like any other person. And he did, does it by night secretly, right? Because he feared not only his father's household, but he feared the men of the city as well. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. So he did everything that God told him to do, but he did it by night because he was fearful of what might happen to him. And they said one to another, who hath done this thing? So now they're woken up in the morning. They realize, hey, our altar of our God is broken down, you know, and who did this? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. So, you know, it makes me wonder as well, like, how, how did they find out if he did it secretly, right? And, and maybe the 10 men that he got to do it with him might have turned on him, you know? You think about, uh, you know, in the end times, it'll be the same. Like people will turn on one another to preserve themselves. And I just wonder whether those that rallied with him to, to accomplish this thing were not as loyal as he thought. And as they inquired, somebody ratted him out, right? And basically told somebody, oh, this is, this is how they found out who, who it was. Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, bring out thy son that he may die because he hath cast down the altar of Baal. So now they want to kill Gideon. And because he hath cut down the grove that was by it, 
So not only, right, the, the, the altar pulled down, but also the grove was cut down. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? So it's interesting that even though his dad was a Baal worshipper, right? And because remember, it was his father's altar, right? But even though um, Gideon pulls down this altar and Joash finds out that it's his son, he still defends his son in the sense of, you know, saying, you know, what, why do you need to plead for Baal? Like if somebody needs to plead for him, why don't you put him to death? He says, he, if he be a God, let him plead for himself. I mean, if he's, he's saying that if he's truly a God, then, you know, won't he just speak for himself and defend himself? So, you know, this, this ought to encourage us to take a stand in our own families. You know, like a lot of you come from maybe Catholic backgrounds and Orthodox backgrounds, and then you say, oh, you know, my family's so Orthodox, my family's so Catholic. That'll never change their mind. But maybe if you took a stand, like Gideon here, and you did something great for the Lord, you pulled down this altar, that might make them go, oh, you know what? That may make them compromise a bit. You know, whereas sometimes we're, all, we're always so busy doing stuff, you know, doing, following their Baal religion, rather than taking a stand for the truth and trying to sway them. But look at what happens here. Like, he does something, and you think, Joash, this is his father's altar, he's worshipping Baal, and yet he says, hey, why don't, if he's really a god, why doesn't he plead for himself? You know? Because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jeroboam, saying, let Baal plead against him, because he had thrown down his altar. So even though he didn't just turn his son over and get his son killed, right? He still renamed his son to say, you know, Baal's going to plead against you. Changed his name from Gideon to Jeroboam. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. So because they are angry at Gideon and they want him dead, they gather an army, right? And now they're pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Jezreel. So this is where, like, you know, later on in the story, you know, Gideon surrounds them because they're sort of like sieging this city in a sense to come and take out Gideon, right? And anyone that stands with him. Then all the Midianites and the Malachites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and Abiezer was gathered after him. So in response to them gathering an army, God fills Gideon with the spirit of boldness, right? He calls the he, he gathers an army, and now an army is gathering in Abiezer, right? And he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh. So not only the men who decided to rally with Gideon, right? But also throughout Manasseh, who also gathered after him, he sent messengers unto Asher, and unto Zebulun, and unto Naphtali. So he sent it through a few of the tribes of Israel and men came out to fight with them in Abiezer against the, the Midianites in Jezreel. And Gideon said unto God, if thou wilt say, so this is the sign that Gideon's most known for. You know, often when people ask God for a sign, um, sometimes it's called, you know, putting out a fleece. You know, they'll say like, you need to put out a fleece and sometimes Christians will use that phrase to say like, well, maybe you need to ask God for a sign. You know? This is where it comes from. And this is the story that Gideon is most famous for. When he asks God for a sign to say, you know, are we going to win this battle? Now, remember, you need to know that, you know, when you ask for a sign and, you, and it's some, you're asking for a sign whether to do something that you know you should do. You know, it's like people saying like, oh God, if you want me to come to church today, you know, give me a sign, like maybe somebody's going to call me or something's going to happen on the news, whatever. You're asking for a, that's not a show of faith. That's showing your lack of faith, right? When you say like, if that, if only this is going to happen or this sign, show me a sign that I need to go soul winning. You know, show me a sign that I need to read the Bible. Show me a sign, like these, these are not, because we know God wants us to do these things. It's not like you have this great faith because you're asking God for a sign. It's, it's oh, you have little faith because you're asking for this sign for God to, confirm to do what he's already commanded you to do. So here Gideon is saying, if thou will save Israel by my hand, I mean, has not God already said that? Has not God already given him a sign where he consumed the offering? Gideon said unto God, if thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. So he's saying, I'm going to put this fleece of wool on the floor. And if the fleece is wet, the ground is dry, then that's the sign that I know you're going to save Israel by my hand. 
And it was so. So even though we have little faith, you know, like God can still be graceful to us. And it was so. For he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wring the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, let not thine anger be hot. Uh, sorry, a bowl full of water. So you can see how it's wet. He's wringed out the water from this fleece. And Gideon said unto God, let not thine anger be hot against me. And I will speak but this once. So see, even that sign wasn't enough. Right? Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. And it's interesting that he even says that. I, let me prove, I pray thee, but this once. Because later on you'll see that he asked for another, another sort of sign. With, with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece. And upon all the ground let there be dew. So I don't know if you notice there. Now he switched it. He's saying this sign, I want the fleece to be wet, the ground to be dry. The second time around, he's like, okay, just to make sure, this time I want the fleece to be dry and the ground to be wet. Right? And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only. And there was dew on all the ground. Right? So that's um, chapter 1 and 6. Right? So we see God, as you see, he sets the scene for Gideon's story. God comes to Gideon, gives him a sign. Gideon throws down the altar. He gathers the Israelites in Abiezer to fight, ask God for a sign. And that's where you get the fleece. Uh, chapter 7 is a little shorter. So then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people, so you see here, that's where his dad renamed him, right? So he was known as Jeroboam. So it's, it's funny that, you know, that the writer here even has to say that to make sure that so people understand that Jeroboam was Gideon. And all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. Just, I just want to ask, um, are you guys a little warm in here? Well, Elizabeth, do you want to just turn, just turn the air on a little bit? Because I think that with the sun coming in and the, and the people here, it's just getting warm. I'm getting warm, so. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, rose, rose up here early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mora in the valley. So it's basically he's gathered, he's got these people together now, his army and their army. Right, so chapter 7 is about the defeat of this other army. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many. And uh, I think this story is, just, is, is, is quite crazy in the sense that God reduces this army down to 300 people. You think like 300? I remember like a movie. It's like 300, wasn't that? Like didn't that come from the Greeks? No! didn't come from the Greeks, right? It came from the Israelites. This is the true 300 story, right? Where 300 people uh, delivered their city from an oppressive uh, nation. It says, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. See, this is why oftentimes God gets glory more so from you know, our weakness, like, uh, like Paul mentioned. You know, his, his strength is made uh, perfect in his weakness because um, God's grace is sufficient for me. We can see here that what God is saying is, see, when the army was too big, how would God get the glory? Because people would just say, well, you just had a bigger army and then you defeated them. So this is why he's trimming it down. And you can see here how he trims it down. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. So anyone who was going to admit that they were afraid to go into battle, he said, send them home. And look how many people went, 22,000 of 32,000. So there were 32,000 that were gathered. That's how big the army was, right? And when he said, hey, if you're fearful, you can go back to your homes, more than two-thirds of them left. Now there's one third of them. I mean, wouldn't that already be discouraging, right? Imagine if you had a group of people and more than half of them leave you in a time where you need to go in for war. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. So even though two thirds have gone, it's still too many. Bring them down unto the water and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee. The same shall go with thee, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall go not, it shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So God's going to trim it down even more. So he brought down the people unto the water. 
And the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth him, shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. All right. So if you're wondering what that might look like, I can imagine that, you know, I don't think that, because you think like a dog, doesn't a dog get down on his knees and kind of like lap? But I mean, I suppose a, God, a dog's not really kneeling down, right? I suppose if they're sitting, you know, they're just like... <laughs> But I can imagine some people would drink by like putting their hand into the water, like that kind of thing. That's what I think it means by like lapith of the water with this tongue. I don't know if they're actually like, you know. But the others and the majority that you see of the 10,000, so I guess 9,700 people got down on their knees and put their head to the water to drink. And who knows if they put this, their head into the water or if they're on their knees, you know, and like that. But... That's how we see the difference here. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. So these people like weren't even... So this was just like totally random. Right? I'm sure God knew who was going to and who wasn't. But that's how he split them up. 300 didn't get down on their knees. 9,700 did. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped... Will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thy hand and let all the other people go, every man into his place? So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent and retained those 300 men and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Now this next bit is uh, where you may not understand what is going on. And so I explain it to you. It's quite interesting what's happening here. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. Now, how many times has God talked about saving Israel by the hand of Gideon and delivered it into thine hand? And yet we see that Gideon was not really a man of great faith. Right? He's asking for these signs and this assurance. He was a fearful man. And it came to pass that night. So God basically tells him, go down to the host of the Midianites. Remember, they're camped elsewhere. He says, go down. Look at verse 10. He says, but if thou fear to go down, go thou with Purah, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards shalt thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. He says, you're going to go down if you're, if you're scared, go with your, your, your servants, and you're going to be able to hear what the soldiers are saying, right? And it's going to strengthen your hand. And it's funny that he says, if you're scared, take Fura. And in verse 11, it doesn't even say he was scared. It just says, then went he down with Fura, <laughs> his servant, onto the outside of the armed men. So you can see that he was fearful. That's why he went with his servant. <laughs> then he went down with Fura, his servant, onto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. So isn't it interesting that if they just went to just go look at the army, they might have got discouraged, right? And say, man, it's like so many of them and we're so little. And, you know, they're like the sand of the sea, you know, like grasshoppers for multitude. The camels were without number, you know, the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow. So notice, who's this dream? You might have missed it, right, when Gershon read the passage. But so Gideon's actually come down to that army and listening to the soldiers of the enemy army. And it's actually a soldier within the enemy army that has had a dream, right? And he's telling his, you know, well, what are they called? Fellow soldier of the dream, right? He says, he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. Now, I'm not sure what the significance of the barley bread is, but it's like this big barley bread comes tumbling down. It says, It came unto a tent and smote it that it fell. So this is basically, this, he has this dream that this bread comes rolling down and basically runs over a tent of a Midianite and overturned it, and, and the tent lay along. And his fellow answered. So now he's sharing this dream, and I don't know if it's of God or what, but he's sharing this dream with his fellow soldier, and his fellow soldier is now giving an interpretation of this dream. And he says, his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else, 
Say, the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand had God delivered Midian and all the hosts. So his fellow soldier realizes, man, this is a dream saying that we're going to lose this battle. This is the sword of Gideon because God's with him. And keep in mind, they have no idea that God's just trimmed this army from 30,000 like down to 300 as well. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. So you see how this gives Gideon some confidence, right? Some boldness to go, ah, you know, even they are fearful and know that God is with us. So he goes back to rally the troops. He divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. So I can imagine what's happening here is, you know, everyone gets a trumpet, 300 trumpets, and then the lamp is being, the pitcher is probably covering the lamp so they can sort of go by night, right? And then, and then you understand now after they blow the trumpet and they cry, sort of the Lord, of the they break the pitchers because then the lights all turn on, right? And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. Behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So it's interesting. And I wonder whether he got that idea because of the, 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 the soldier who was interpreting the dream. So this is nothing other than the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon... And the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. So the, I believe there's three watches throughout the night. So they're like in the, right in the middle of the night. And they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. So they surrounded the camp. This is just 300 of them. So you, I don't know how much they were spread out for 300 men to be surrounding this camp of the Midianites. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers, and held the lamps in their left hands, and the trumpets in their right hands, to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. They stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord said, Every man sought against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the hosts fled to Bethshitta in Zerarath, and to the border of Abel Maholah, Unto Tabath. So what actually happens here? When they go around, they're surrounded, they blow the trumpets, they break the pitches, the lights, all, you know, all the lamps, they realize they're surrounded. What happens? There's confusion within the camp and they actually end up attacking each other, right? So that does most of the job for them. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Nathali, out of Asher, and of all Manasseh, and pursued after Midian. So they all come out, and then they, now they're chasing them out of the land. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Ephraim, Ephraim saying, Come down against the Midianites, and take before them the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. So now that they've driven them out, now he's saying, Come out and reclaim that land. And they took two princes of the Midianites, so the two leaders, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb. So obviously because they had oppressed them and had the land, they probably put up landmarks of their own countrymen. And Zeb, they slew the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. So that's the story of Gideon. But I want to just, so there's just three things I want to just take from this story. I know I've spent a lot of time already going through the story, but we won't spend too much time going through these things, but just some encouragement for you um, in today's day that we live in, unfortunately. One is, I want you to understand that fear is normal. You know, fear is normal. Sometimes fear stops us from doing great things, but, but fear is normal. It's not necessarily good, you know, a fear of man, but it's something that everyone experiences. You know, like people often will you know, ask, you know, maybe successful people, people that have accomplished great things. And, you know, sometimes I listen to the, you know, you know, you guys know that I follow like the UFC. And even when you hear the interviews from fighters, like they still go into the ring terrified, you know, like nervous. But 
some of them, they, they try and feed off it, they realize, and, and sometimes people just think, um, you know, that's how you know you're still alive. You know, I heard one uh, speaker once say that that same response of excitement is the same response of fear, but it's just our mindset, how we respond to that feeling that we have, that, that physical feeling in our body. But I want you to know that fear is normal. So if you're ever fearful to do what's right, that is a normal thing. Now, it's not necessarily a good thing to be fearful of man. Jesus says here in Luke 12, verse 1, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Right? So we, we ought not to fear man. But what I'm telling you this morning is that it's normal in the sense that everyone has that feeling. Even you see people and say, look, you look so bold. You look like you're not fearful. Generally, people do have fear, uh, even though they, they just have learned to overcome it and you know, have that boldness to overcome it as opposed to let, let it stop them from moving forward. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. So fear is not bad in and of itself. This is who we ought to fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. All right, so one way we overcome a fear of man is to have a greater fear of God. Right? We fear God more than the fear of man is going to become significantly less, isn't it? And this is why Jesus makes this comparison. He's not only is he telling us not to fear man, but he's also telling us how we overcome that fear of man. And like I talked about as we went through Judges chapter 6 and 7 with Gideon, we see that Gideon was a fearful man. Right? Judges 6 and 11, there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Ab Abiezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So you remember he was hiding. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Judges 6, 27, then Gideon took 10 men of his servants, remember this, and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And uh, the last one from, from Gideon, it says, it came to pass the same night. This is the one I told you guys is quite uh, funny. And the Lord said unto him, arise, get thee down into the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Fura, thy servant, down to the host. And if you remember, he did actually end up going down with Pharaoh, showing that he was, he had fear as well. So, not, you know, people think, well, man, I wish I was like Gideon. Hey, well, Gideon <laughs> well, had fear. Gideon was a fearful man and did not always have the faith. And remember, like I said, you know, asking for a sign, it isn't a show of faith. It's actually little faith. But you know what? We can be encouraged by it because, you know, God still uses men of little faith, right? He still uses men of women of little faith. His disciples ones of little faith. Matthew 8, 23, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? So you see there the link between the size of your faith or the amount of faith you have and the fear you have, right? Why is it? Now you understand because the more faith you have, the more fear of God you have, the less fear of man you're going to have. So you can see why. Why is it linked to my how much faith I have, how fearful I am? Because it's whether you believe God and fear God. It says, why are you fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? So whilst fear is normal, everyone experiences it. You know, there's ways we can overcome it. And um, you know, we can be encouraged that you know, even though we are, we are fearful at times, and everyone has fear of man, even though they shouldn't, God still uses men that were fearful. I mean, they, all the disciples were fearful. Think about the day of Pentecost when they were all hiding. Right? It wasn't until the... You know, the Spirit of God came down and it gave them that great boldness. But we have that same Spirit of God. We can have that same boldness. You know, fear is going to stop you from doing great things. Right? Proverbs 29, 25. This is a great verse to memorize. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. 
See, fear is going to stop you from doing that. It's a snare. It's like a trap. It's going to stop you from moving forward. It's going to keep you stuck. You know, unfortunately, may, you know, it's probably fear this morning that, you know, that there's a smaller group here this morning. Fear of man bringeth a snare. You know, fear is going to prevent you from doing a lot of things in your life. You know, fear may prevent you from getting your first soul saved. You know, fear may pre prevent you from even giving the gospel for the first time. Fear may pre prevent you from going soul winning. You know, you know, fear, you know, would have prevented me definitely from getting my first soul saved because, you know, you say like, well, you come soul winning with me and you say, Victor, you're so confident in talking about the gospel and sharing the gospel. Yeah, but it wasn't always like that. You know, like when I first went out, sharing the gospel. I was scared too. You know, you fumble and you say the wrong thing. You, start, you, know, you feel sick, but you got to go through that because if you don't, you're never going to get better. And if you fear, man, you fear these situations, it's going to bring a snare upon you, right? So fear can prevent you from doing this. Fear, you know, fear would have prevented me from finding a wife. You know, like, man, you know, like I remember when I was with, you know, Stucky and the boys in that, you know, in that place, you know, I mean, fear can make you not say hello and just start the conversation, just give it a shot. You can see how fear can prevent you a lot of things. I mean, fear would have prevented me from starting a church. You know, thank God I can look back and, and see how God has used these last six years. But, you know, when we started the church, I mean, we had no idea who was going to join us, no idea where people would come from. But, you know, God builds his church and we just faithfully keep serving. So, you know, fear will stop you. So, you know, what will, what will fear stop you from doing? Do you know what I mean? I mean, look at what Gideon accomplished, you know, you know, with God's help. But, you know, if you're fearful, you kind of think, you know, are there some great things that God has planned in your life? But is fear going to be a snare to you? Is fear going to stop you from doing these great things that God wants you to do? So that's number one. Fear is normal. It's not good. Don't let fear stop you from doing great things for God. Number two is be the solution. This is the thing that I think of the most when I think of Gideon's story, I mean, maybe some people think of the, the 300 and the, the lamps breaking and everything, like the confusion. Some people think of Gideon, they think of the fleece, right? When I think of the story of Gideon, I think what resonated with me the most in this story is to, to be the solution, right? Not the problem. Not, don't be part of the problem. Don't just complain. Do something about it and recognize that you may be here to fix the problem that you see in the world, that you're complaining about, right? That you see this thing and say, who's, who's, what, who, why is it like this? You know, who's doing anything about it? But we're reminded from Gideon's story that that may be why you exist, right? That God is sending you to fix the problem and be the solution. Remember in Judges 6 verse 12, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told of us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee. And I hope those words that God said to Gideon resonate with you. And when you think and complain about things, you complain about the state of the world, you know, that God's saying to you, have not I sent thee? You know, maybe that's why you're here, to fix that problem. So have this mindset that you can be a solution to the problem. Oftentimes people always complain about things. They complain, oh, you know, how bad the government is, and how bad the government is, and how bad our company is, and how bad this is, and how bad everything is. Well, maybe that's why you are there in the world to fix this problem, just like God used Gideon, right? So be, you can be the solution, right? Don't just be a complainer, right? Because if you are, then you're just part of the problem. So you want to take initiative, take initiative, right? And, you know, are you using your talents to serve God? You know, all of us have different abilities here. Sometimes it's great, like when I see, you know, all the different um, things that people are capable of in this church. And we come together and make things happen and you use your talents and abilities to serve the Lord. So that's a challenge for you this morning. Is Are you using the talents that God has given you to serve God, right? And, and maybe the, the talents that he's given you are there to fix a problem in the world. But if you just complain, 
and you're not the solution, then it's going to make very little difference. And you know what? If you do nothing about it, it ultimately can affect you too. It reminds me of the story of Esther. You remember Esther? She hesitated to do what's right. She was in a position where she had the ability to do something right. And we see here as well that she became the solution, right? She, and she, she needed to be encouraged. So we see these people that, that we think of as great. They have their doubts. They have their lack of faith. And they need to be encouraged in the way. But look at what it says about Esther. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. You see, like if you do nothing, it's going to affect you as well. Just like in Esther, if she didn't do anything about it, he's saying, hey, you're not going to escape this judgment as well where they're going to kill all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You can see how it's so similar, I find, to Gideon's story. It's like, no, you, I sent you at this time in this place. And he's saying to Esther, how do you know whether you have been brought to the kingdom and raised to this position for this very moment, right? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Some famous words from Esther there. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. So if you do nothing about it, you know, that problem that needs to be fixed is going to affect you too. So be the solution, not the problem. The last one I want to talk to you about and encourage you today is God can use the few. God can use the few, right? Sometimes we think, oh, you know, but what difference can we make? There's so little of us. I mean, do you not read this story and think, I mean, is that even really a, still a point? Like God can use a few people, right, to do great things. And if you know how this world works, <clears throat> even in the political realm, <clears throat> There's a very few amount of people that cause most of the waves, right? So don't underestimate what a, you know, a small group of people, a small group of bold people can do. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many. I won't go, I won't go over this for sake of time, but you remember the story, how he whittled down that army to 300 people. And I think what this encourages us to, to think is and to know that even if we are in the minority and there are a few of us, we can accomplish great things. It reminds me of the story of Daniel. <clears throat> but before I go to the story of Daniel, I wanted to share with you why, <clears throat> why do I think God used this, the way they drink to separate them up. And obviously, it's not, a, it's not said in the Bible, but this is the thought I have <clears throat> of why did those that lapped like a dog like, were used to battle, but those that got down on their knees to drink? And I think the symbolism there is that the 9,700, they so easily bowed down their knees, right, to, to take that water to drink. But it's almost like the others sort of symbolized they weren't even willing to bow down to get a drink of water. So I, I wonder whether that has some significance where the people that were willing to bow down more easily, God said, I'm not going to use them, right? And we'll use the 300 that were righteous, you know, stood boldly up even when it came to drinking the water. And so when I thought on this sort of difference and why God may have used this symbolism for us as a story, it obviously made me think of Daniel and his three friends, right? When they were asked to bow down to the golden image, right, that, that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And I know we're all familiar with this story, but I want us to be encouraged this morning as we read their response. It always gives me chills when I think about their boldness in this scenario. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? 
Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music ye fall down, and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. He's saying that we're not hesitating when we give you this response. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And isn't that crazy to have that sort of boldness, to be able to say to the king, at, 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 at threat of death, right? Threat of being thrown into the burning, fiery furnace to say, you know, we don't hesitate in answering you that we will not bow to this image. And we know God's going to deliver us. And he's like the icing on the cake. Even if he doesn't deliver us, we still won't bow. Isn't that an amazing thought? And doesn't that encourage you to take the same stand? Hopefully it does. Um, that we can take this example from Daniel and his three friends right so you know we need sometimes i think we need to stop looking elsewhere for people who are going to do something about this world you know because it can start right here with us with the people in this room right you look around the room guys this the god can use this group of people to do great things like the 300 he used to do great things but Here's the caveat, right? We need to be bold. We need to be, how are we going to be bold? We need to be righteous, right? Look at what the Bible says here in Proverbs 28. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. See, we need to be righteous if we're going to be bold. You know, see, we're not going to be bold when we're lazy, Right? We're not going to be bold when we're worldly right? because we're not going to have the love of the Father in us if we have the love of the world in us like we talked about last week. You know, we're not going to be bold when we're skipping church all the time. You know, we're not going to be bold if we're never reading our Bible. Right? We're not going to be bold if we're never praying for one another and we're never learning and growing. Are you going to be bold when you skip soul winning all the time? You know, the Bible says if you, if, the, if you run with the footmen and they've wearied you, how do you contend with horses? Right? And you want to be bold in this time, you've got to be bold when it's easier because you're not going to be bold when times get harder. Right? So if you want to be bold, we need to be righteous. So now, now you understand why it's important for us to live a godly life because if you want to be bold in times like now, that's where it's going to make a difference. So we're not going to be bold. If we're full of worldliness, we're going to have more fear of man than we are going to have fear of God. All right, so in conclusion, you know, I hope you learned a bit from Gideon this morning. I hope it encouraged you, you know, the example of Esther, example of Daniel. But just to recap, you know, don't be discouraged because you're fearful. God has used fearful men in the past to do great things. Number two is be part of the solution, right? Don't be part of the problem. Don't just complain. This might be why God has you here on this earth, right? You have certain abilities, use them for his glory, right? And don't be discouraged because we're in the minority, right? God can use a small group of righteous believers, right, to do what's right. But, you know, we're not going to have the boldness whilst we live in worldliness. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. I pray, Lord, that you will give us boldness. You help us, Lord, to be righteous so that we can be bold as a lion. And we pray, Lord, for each and every one here. I pray, Lord, that you will raise them up to do what you've called them to do and what you have them here on this earth to do. So, Lord, I pray that you'll give us your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.